we now have the, the real pleasure of our first panel of the day. Um, we'll, we'll be exploring uh, this new era for North American energy that we are now embarking on. And to chair this discussion, I have the great pleasure of introducing Ted Walker, partner at Guidehouse. Ted, over to you. Great. Thanks, Owen. Um, I'd like to welcome you to our panel on a new era, collaboration, climate, and COP26. Uh, as Owen says, my name is Ted Walker, and I'll be moderating this discussion. Uh, I'm really excited about the next 45 minutes, and I'm honored to share the stage with this distinguished panel, which I'll introduce in just a moment. Um, first of all, we're seeing a significant increase in the focus on climate change and decarbonization in the North America energy provider industry. Um, one data point that many of you might have heard is that over two thirds of North American households are served by utilities with 100% carbon reduction targets. Most of these have done have, have happened in the last uh, 18 to 24 months, and most of them have done this voluntarily. Um, while this is often characterized as a transition over the next decade or three, uh, as compared to the last one to two centuries, uh, this will truly be transformational for the industry. So during the next 45 minutes, we'll cover a number of topics related to this transition, including overall thoughts on, on this new era, the impacts of COP26, and the importance of collaboration. So before we jump into the discussion, I'd like to introduce myself and our distinguished panelists. Again, my name is Ted Walker. I'm a partner at Guidehouse in the Energy Sustainability and Infrastructure Practice. I lead our Southeast and Mid-Atlantic energy provider market and have the pleasure of personally working with uh, many of our clients on the strategy, design, implementation, and operations for our new business models in this energy transition. Joining me are Catherine Neby, Chief Sustainability Officer for Duke Energy, Kathleen Barone, Executive Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer for Constellation Energy, and Tristan Grimbert, CEO for EDF Renewables. This should be a really exciting discussion as these panelists represent organizations that have slightly different positions within the energy value, value chain. And as you'll see, they have slightly different perspectives as well. So without further ado, let's jump into the first topic. I'd like to ask each of our panelists to provide a brief introduction of yourself, your organization, what you see as the outlook of the, of the transition in the energy sector in North America, and how is your organization leading? Let's start with Catherine. Thanks, Ted. I'm really excited to be here. So I, I'm Catherine Neby. Um, I uh, have been working in environmental and social sustainability for well over 20 years. Uh, I spent about six and a half years with WWF. I like to say pandas, not wrestlers, uh, leading a large partnership with Coca-Cola. And then over to uh, Walmart, where most recently I led ESG on behalf of the enterprise. And about a year ago, a year plus, ago, I came over to Duke to lead sustainability, the foundation, and then stakeholder strategy. Um, and although I've been working at the intersection between business and environmental and social concerns for a very long time, I've never been able to say that our climate strategy is our business strategy until I came to Duke. And this is such a point of distinction for our company as we're all in towards our aspiration of net zero um, for electricity generation by 2050 and net zero in methane emissions for our natural gas distribution business by, by 2030. And when I think about the clean energy transformation, we're investing $125 billion in the next decade in our communities towards that, 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 that transformation. And I, I think we have a real opportunity um, as a business and, and candidly as a sector to really be thinking about how does this energy transformation really lift society, lift communities. And I think about the economic opportunities available to our communities with the clean energy transition. I think about a, a resilient energy system that is really well prepared to help navigate against the impacts of climate change and other disruption. And then finally, I think about this really important conversation on justice, equity, and inclusion. So how are we building that energy system in a way that also takes into account all communities um, and lifts all communities forward. I think you're muted, Ted. Apologies, yes, th thanks, Catherine. Kathleen, would you like to go next? Sure, thank you, Ted, and good morning, everyone. 
Uh, I currently have two roles right now. I, I work for Exelon, the nation's largest producer of clean energy and the largest utility company by customer count. And for Exelon, I'm, our, I'm responsible for our policy work at the state and federal level. But we are in the process of spinning off our generation and customer business. So post spin, as Ted said, I've been named chief strategy officer for that business, which means I'll be responsible for corporate strategy, corporate development, the, the policy work, communications and philanthropy and our sustainability strategy, which much like what Catherine said, sustainability strategy is a business strategy for a company like ours. From our perspective, um, on, on behalf of both companies, our outlook on the transition of the energy sector in North America is that we need to step it up and we need to do it quickly. Uh, at the most elemental level, that means we need to replace fossil fuels with zero carbon sources of electricity on the grid. And we need to transition other sectors of the economy to electricity or to other carbon-free sources of energy as quickly and as equitably as possible. Uh, at Exelon, we've spent much of the last 10 years trying to prevent premature retirements of nuclear stations, which provide about 20% of the electricity in the US without carbon or other harmful emissions. And, and that's because what happens when a nuclear plant shuts down is is we replace carbon-free energy with fossil fuels instead of the other way around. So for example, when Three Mile Island shut down in Pennsylvania, that one small reactor was making more carbon-free energy than all the wind and all the solar in the entire state. Uh, if Diablo Canyon shuts down in California, that'll be like shutting down 130% of all the wind in California. So as a country, we need to maintain our existing sources of clean energy, and we need to build, deploy, and connect many, many more terawatt hours of new clean energy at the same time. So we need rapid change. Uh, we'll talk about this later in the panel. The, the legislation pending in Washington, the Build Back Better bill, will hopefully put this progress uh, into overdrive. Uh, and I don't think it's hyperbolic to say, you know, this next decade is the climate decade. The, the decisions that are made by all stakeholders policymaker, consumers, regula regulators, and, and corporations are gonna set the course for how achievable it is to get to net zero by 2050. Uh, we have been preparing for this transition in our company and advocating for policy for many years. At this point, we make 12% of all the clean energy in the United States at our nuclear, wind, solar, and hydro assets, uh, nearly double the amount from any other energy company. And we have the lowest emissions rate among large electricity uh, producers. The next closest company has nearly five times the rate of, of emissions. Uh, so our perspective is we gotta get on with it. Uh, getting to the goal is gonna take corporations, customers, NGOs, and the media, frankly, working together to keep the spotlight on industry, make sure that uh, corporations are making clean choices and also on government to make sure they are adopting smart policies that will drive decarbonization in the most cost-effective way. Great, thanks Kathleen. And last but not least, Tristan. Thank you, Ted, and, and good morning all. I'm Tristan Grimworth, I'm the CEO of EDF Renewable North America. Uh, we've been founded in the mid eighties as the, uh, the first of one of the first uh, IPPs in the renewable space, wind company initially. We've developed 20 gigawatts of uh, wind, solar and storage in, in North America since. So really uh, the energy transition is at the core of our existence. It's our core value to deliver a sustainable energy future. Uh, in addition to that, we are a uh, subsidiary of EDF, which is uh, the largest European utility, which is uh, almost totally carbon free already with nuclear, uh, hydro and, and renewables, and uh, with a, an average uh, footprint per, per uh, uh, red payer that is uh, way, way, way below the European average. So um, we, we've been really at the core of this transformation with, with our partners. And the only thing I would add to the um, uh, the urge that we hear from, from Kathleen and, and, and Catherine is that uh, we want to do that with the best possible practices with our business partners, with the communities that we serve and that we're part of for 30, 40 years when we build those projects and for the environment as well. So it's very important for us to not only develop renewable power, but also do it in the right way so that it minimizes the impact. Happy to dig back into that later. Great. Well, thank you all for uh, for your uh, for some opening comments here. Uh, let's let's dive in and uh, talk a little bit about COP26. Um, I'd like to uh, understand your thoughts on how COP26 impacted the uh, the North America energy industry transition. Um, so we'll start with Catherine. What are your thoughts on the progress made during COP26, and do you see any um, impact of this to your company strategy? 
Yeah, um, so I was fortunate. I was at COP26 and I've been at a handful of other COPs and supported some others. And I think just to level set folks on the outcomes of COP26, there was a lot that, that was underway and I invite you to, to learn more. But um, at the highest level, there was alignment with the Glasgow Climate Pact to phase down um, unabated coal, um, to double the amount of support for adaptation in developing economies, and we saw 100, company, 100 countries, excuse me, come together, including the US, to agree to a 30% reduction of methane emissions by 2030. So, so I think we've seen a lot of progress at an international level to advance, um, to advance towards uh, net zero, which is really, really exciting. Some themes that emerged, certainly, that, that I found very um, interesting and powerful was this emerging discussion on fossil fuels specifically. I think it was the first time that you saw coal men mentioned in some of the international, uh, the formal agreements. And so that, that's, I think, a big step forward for, for COP26. And I think equally important, you saw a real conversation around the just transition. I think um, having worked in sustainability for a long time, you are going to be far better off if you're able to bring not just um, the environmental bent to the discussion, not just the economic bent to the discussion, but also really um, wrap your arms around the social side uh, uh, of the equation. I think we're seeing a continued emphasis on electrification and uh, an emerging conversation that I was really excited about action and kind of no regrets. So I think it was a really positive step forward. Um, for, for Duke Energy, we've, we set our, one of our initial climate goals in 2010, uh, we updated them in 2019, leaned in on methane emissions in 2020, and are now really leaning in on environmental justice and the just transition. So I see the conversation that's happening at an international level to really mirror the steps and the actions that we're taking as a company and have been for, for some time. I think taking a step back as someone who's also been an observer or supporter um, of, of the various COPs, you know, I recall, I don't even remember which COP it was, but I recall Copenhagen, when you couldn't get a business to show up really at the COP to really talk about something called climate change. And then I remember Paris, where there was a lot of enthusiasm about seeing companies lean in and talk about the business case for action on climate, that it wasn't uh, a, a choice, that that was a false choice, that really there is a business case. Um, and then you fast forward to, to now, and we're seeing in every um, meeting, we're seeing continued forward progress. And if you had told me um, back in Copenhagen that we would see um, these, these giants of industry um, leading NGOs, leading civil sector representatives really coming together to take the important steps and have the hard conversations that are so necessary for the transformation to land us where we are with Glasgow, I would have been, I mean, you would have bowled me over. Is the progress enough? Probably not, but are we continuing at every international convening to move forward and, and move that football down the field? Absolutely. So I take a lot of heart in that. Great, Catherine. And, and any thoughts on how this is? Uh, any changes to uh, Duke's strategy because of it, or or do you see is it is it, is it uh, kind of a full steam ahead as planned? Yeah, I, I think it just continues to reinforce um, the efforts that we have underway in terms of our our aspirations to to meet the ambitions of the Paris Agreement. So I don't know that I see a, a massive sea change. I think what I I really welcome is the fact that we are now having really meaningful conversation. It's not that we weren't in the past, it's just, I think there's a new flavor and a new energy, for, forgive the pun, but a new energy around the conversation, which is very much kind of, okay, pragmatically, what is it gonna really take? What are the real issues that we need to dive into? How are we really gonna get these sectors of the economy that are the heavy emitters really participating in the conversation? And, and I think for a while there with the cops, you see some businesses show up, but it tended to be folks that were less of the industrial sector. And now I think we're seeing more and more of that. So for me, it just it reinforces that the path that we set in, in 2010 and, and updated in 2019 and 2020 is, is the right one. And that we're, we're in line with uh, international and national expectations. Great, no, thank you. Kathleen, what about you? What do you take away from COP26 and, and how has this uh, impacted uh, Constellation or, or Exelon's overall strategy? Uh, well, I think Catherine did a great job of sort of laying out the high points of the uh, the gathering and the the challenges yet yet to be addressed. I mean, clearly, cops are are 
um, changing their composition, as she pointed out, way more corporate um, attendance and, uh, and, and way more enthusiasm overall. But obviously they're sort of, they're as much about the journey as about the destination. You know, getting world leaders together um, to talk about a problem this big um, is, is a, a process that takes some time. It's good to see the US play more of a leadership role. It's good, as she said, to see the more than 100 companies making the methane reduction pledge. Um, but, but obviously no single meeting or agreement is ever gonna be enough. I mean, we, we have a lot of work to do here and it's good that I think there was 151 companies submitted new uh, NDCs. Um, I, I was not as lucky as she was. I did not get to make the trip, but we did have two other leaders, uh, one from Exxon, one from Constellation uh, at the event. Um, I can't say that COP itself uh, will result in a change in our strategy uh, at Constellation. Uh, we as a company have been executing on our consistent business strategy of reducing emissions since, since we were founded. And as a company, we've already exceeded the Paris goal. We have reduced our emissions by more than 80% since 2005 between fossil retirements, divestitures, and investing in growth that's at less than the marginal emission rate in our regions. But for us, that doesn't mean we're done. We have lots more to do to continue to reduce our scope one emissions, but more to the point to really help our customers set and achieve their own carbon reduction goals. That's, that's gonna be a major focus for us as we see the world community come together um, and continue to uh, ratchet up their ambitions in terms of how many uh, emission reductions they, they will achieve. Right. No, thank you. Thank you. Um, Tristan, I'd like to dig in a little bit. Catherine mentioned uh, equity and just transition. I'd like to get your thoughts on, uh, on, on that, uh, that avenue. Sure. Um, thank you. And, and to the previous point, I just would like to remind everybody that the, uh, today a renewable demand in, in the U.S. is over 50% by CNI directly. So the greenwashing era is over and, and, and companies are taking that very seriously and that, 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 that's critical. Um, but to that point, um, in terms of, of equity, the first thing to remember is that uh, climate change affects first and foremost the industrial communities. When you look at the number of uh, natural disasters that are happening, it's, uh, it's even more urgent for underserved communities or for uh, developing countries to, to fight climate change. And to that extent, carbon is fungible uh, at, the, at the planet level. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm a partisan of trying to reduce carbon everywhere and uh, to follow the path of least resistance so that we, uh, if we uh, start to reduce carbon in the US, that's good for Brazil as well and, and, and vice versa. So I think it's, it's, uh, it's important to think of it as a global action. Every time you build a renewable project somewhere, you help reduce carbon everywhere. And that's, that's a positive step that serves everybody. So I think it's important to remember that. So let's, let's try to build as many megawatts as we can per year um, and, and, and not allocate too much. I'm not sure it's a good, good debate to try to allocate between countries and et cetera. Uh, the second thing is that um, the, uh, the, the Biden administration thankfully has really refocused on, on uh, regulation over pollution because let's remember that the, uh, I think the most, the, the biggest impact of carbon, uh, of, of energy um, injustice, environmental injustice is really to have underserved community bear the blunt of pollution and have their, their communities more affected by local impact. So re-regulating the industry that has been largely deregulated under Trump era is, is a good thing and will, will protect uh, underserved communities. Um, and, and lastly, uh, I would like to mention the fact that uh, we have a tremendous opportunity as we are hiring all a lot. We have a lot of need for um, a new workforce and uh, we are reaching out to um, uh, cottages and to underserved community once again to try to find the talent that we need. And I think that's also a great opportunity. So let's reduce carbon everywhere we can. Let's make sure that no community is affected by pollution and let's open as much as we can um, uh, the, the, the job market to, uh, to talent wherever they come from. So that's, that's kind of the threefold aspect for me of a just transition. Thank you. Uh, those are some great thoughts. So appreciate your uh, th thoughts there. Um, several of my colleagues were in Glasgow as well uh, for COP26, and uh, I think similar comments you know made above. One of the key themes that they took away, and uh, as they kind of write and blog about this, is that the theme of we can't do it alone. You know, collaboration is required, um, and several of you mentioned that as well. So I'd like to uh, really like to kind of uh, ask each of you to, to provide some overall thoughts on collaboration 
uh, you know, how, how will collaboration, how important is it in the, uh, in the transition in North America? So uh, Kathleen, we'll start with you. Okay, thanks, Ted. Um, so I, I thought in response to this question, I would talk a little about um, R&D, because I think in the area of research and development and deployment of new technologies, that's really an important area where collaboration between industry um, and academia and government is really um, top of mind. You know, the, we know where we need to get to, but most of these ambitious goals that have been set um, they, re they rely on deployment of solutions that we're not currently using right now. Um, I think there's a, an estimate from the IEA that 75% of the reductions necessary to meet the global net, net zero goal are dependent on technology that are not at commercial maturity yet. So we know we need to move promising new technologies quickly through this process and get to com commercialization, but collaboration is really the key in our view um, to getting the different companies and the different sectors and the policymakers all aligned, um, and you know this, the, the concept of multilateral governance is, is important there too in terms of driving clean energy, uh, cleaner energy products and services. We um, are offering service these services now to our to our customers and helping them, as I mentioned early, find ways to decarbonize. Um, and so that's one example of a partnership that's that's bilateral, but it's really the multilateral opportunities that I mentioned before that I think are going to drive the technology development, which will help uh, drive demand. And, and uh, so I'll offer those as some opening comments on this topic. Great, thank you. Catherine, what about you? Yeah, it's, um, I heard this great line. Um, it was a Chatham House rules conversation. So unfortunately I can't attribute it, but um, uh, a great line that uh, progress moves forward at the speed of trust. And so when I think about um, not just climate change, but all of the other really thorny issues that are out there that is going that, that no one sector, no one company can solve alone. I, I kind of come back to this notion of trust. So how are we um, as individuals representing companies, representing a sector, um, really leaning in on some of these issues like climate change, which is uh, a, a huge um, opportunity for, for all of us to be continuing to make good progress in. How are we thinking about working with other, others and then creating that environment where, where trust is kind of the fundamental currency and we can move forward? Um, so, so I, and I, I've just worked, I, I've never seen companies really meaningfully address issues in isolation. They've always leaned in, in my experience, on public-private partnerships or multi-stakeholder collaborations in a, in a pre-competitive way. So I think there is such a role to play um, in collaboration. I think, um, two things or, or maybe three examples and one just to build on on a point that Kathleen is making where we're seeing a lot of real value and collaboration um, to look at the use case for hydrogen as a long duration battery technology um, battery storage technology we're partnering with Clemson University and Siemens and so I think we're seeing there this this richness of discussion dialogue and expertise coming together to really um, tackle a, a, a very promising technology um, over time. I think another um, place where we're seeing real collaboration is in an initiative we just um, partnered with and launched with them um, with Microsoft and Accenture, looking at methane detection, detection and monitoring. So the standard way that you calculate greenhouse gas emissions for a natural gas distribution system is to, and I'm overly simplifying here, but essentially look at the miles of pipe and then multiply it by a methane emissions factor. And using the technology that we're leveraging in partnership with Microsoft and Accenture, we're, we're taking advantage of satellites and fixed wing aircraft and very sophisticated um, math essentially to try and figure out where on a natural gas distribution system do you see methane leaks? And then can you really rapidly go there and fix the leaks so that you're taking one, a lot of the drudgery out of the work in terms of trying to find where the leak might be and you're moving straight towards the action of reducing that leak. Um, and two, you're getting a real time picture of what's actually happening on the system at a given moment in time, which um, if you've been working in greenhouse gas emissions, um, monitoring and detection for any length of time, I will have to say that's like the silver bullet is figuring out what's actually happening, no matter if it's scope one, scope two, or scope three, no matter which sector of the economy, everyone's trying to figure out what is, what is the truth in terms of the emissions, where are they, and then how can I move to reduce them as quickly as possible. So I'm really excited about that partnership as well. 
Great. Those are uh, those are really interesting examples. Uh, Tristan, what about you? How, how important is collaboration in the, in the transition? Very, very important, very important for business in general and, and especially in the energy transition. Uh, I'd say that over the 35 years that we've been developing project in, in the US, uh, collaboration is we, we, we live and breathe that every day. When you think about putting hundreds of millions of dollars of investment that are now trapped in a community, you don't want to be adverse to that community. You work with them, you try to facilitate you know, the layout and, and how you're going to operate your, your wind farm or your solar farm from the get-go. Collaboration, in particular with the local communities, is important. And as I speak to you from hotel room just before the American Clean Power uh, Energy Association, uh, I can tell you the collaboration within industry is, is also important to develop the best practices. But a little bit like, like Catherine, I would like to give one example of collaboration, which I think is really, really um, uh, exemplary, is the American Wind Wildlife Institute that we founded, I think, 12 or 13 years ago, that um, uh, gather basically around the table, around data, uh, the NGOs, environmental NGOs, the government uh, agencies and, and industry players like us to collect and process all the data about environmental impact uh, biodiversity and et cetera on, on, on wildlife to understand what, what are the best sites where to locate project and how to mitigate the impact. And, you know, we've been through the last 20 years, we've been through a lot of uh, misconceptions about the impact of our project. And again, I'm not saying there is no impact, but they can be largely mitigating. That's a very good example where beyond, I can tell you around that table, we're not always in agreement. We have different uh, point of view, different uh, ideology, I would say, different you know, civil servants, NGOs, uh, businesses, but we, uh, we gather and, and, and collect around the idea of using data to do the best we can. And, and I think it's a great example, and I'd, I'll, I'd like to see more of that in different part of the industry. We're, we're trying to create that in offshore as well, uh, which is a nascent industry in, in, in the US, uh, to be able to, uh, well, to do what we have to do with the minimal impact to the environment in general. That's great. Really, really interesting example there. Um, so I'd like to dig a bit, uh, dig a bit deeper and explore collaboration at a couple of different levels. Um, so I want to start off with uh, with Kathleen, your thoughts on on how do you see the unprecedented bipartisan infrastructure bill, also known as the uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, as well as the pending Build Back Better legislation. How do you see this driving collaboration um, at the federal level? Sure, I, I think they're gonna be a game changer, frankly. I mean, obviously federal policy is needed to help drive decarbonization in the US. We've all known that, and we're finally getting some uh, this year, uh, both with the infrastructure bill and then with the Build Back Better bill. Um, between them, they're estimated to cut greenhouse gas emissions by over a billion metric tons by 2030. So we are strongly in support of both. Uh, we would have liked to have seen uh, a, a, a climate solution like a carbon tax, a dividend, or a clean energy standard. But even without those two uh, policies, the investments in clean energy and in new technology contained in the Infrastructure Bill and the BBB Act are going to make very important near-term progress in decarbonizing all sectors of our economy. And to your point, drive collaboration in industry. And I hope we'll have some time to talk more about hydrogen on this session, because I think that's a great example of where uh, government is using policy to, to help facilitate that kind of uh, collaboration. And, but the other thing I'll mention, I think Tristan mentioned this before, is the federal government also has an important role to play on the regulatory side. Uh, the US EPA has existing authority that it can and should be using to adopt regulations to help continue to reduce national greenhouse gas emissions um, through the regulatory process. Uh, but I should just put in a plug, um, you know, in addition to federal support, uh, there is obviously an opportunity for, for local governments, state and municipal governments to drive uh, decarbonization. They, they frankly have been doing so uh, in the absence of leadership at the, at the national level. So, Many of our states where we operate have set aggressive decarbonization goals that exceed the federal standards. And as I said, they've been really incubators of clean energy policies that have driven expansion in energy efficiency, community solar, and many other programs that have driven reductions in pollution. So uh, while as a, as a company that serves customers in 48 states, we're, we're very welcoming of federal policy. I don't wanna lose sight of the role that state and local governments uh, can play in reducing carbon as well. Great. No, some great thoughts there and, and definitely agree with the game changer uh, comment there. Tristan, what about you? What are your thoughts on this, uh, on these uh, two, two bills? So 
So um, along the the line that Kathleen mentioned, I, I those are great uh, great bills, and they will they will progress the issue uh, quite a bit. I also would like to not forget about carbon tax as well, or carbon price, or carbon credits, one way or the other. When you run a business or when you run whatever, you put the KPI on what you want to improve. We want to reduce carbon. Let's put a KPI on carbon. That's that's the logical, that's the most economic, that's the most American thing to do is measure what you want to improve and work at it. And, and cap and trade would be a perfect example. So it's a little bit too bad that we didn't get there, but uh, I'm a bit advocate and hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll get there uh, one day. Um, maybe on the collaboration piece, beyond the regulation itself, I think the, the, the state of mind of the agency or the government is also very, very important. Uh, I'd like to take two examples. The first one is uh, on the offshore business. Um, the, uh, the Biden administration has decided not only they are, they are pushing for new regulation and legislation, but also they have decided to take a much more uh, inclusive and proactive um, uh, collaborative uh, approach. And by gathering the states, the industry, and the various agencies around the same table, we, we are moving the question of how to cite win, um, offshore wind in a much faster pace than we, we did before. I mean, within six months, we make, make more progress than the last six years. So I think it's, it's also very important to give a voice to every stakeholder to be able to advance the, um, the, the issue. Uh, the other example along those lines will be NYSADA. Uh, New York may have started a little bit late, but they have a very uh, willingful approach and, uh, and uh, um, uh, a collaborative approach. They, in between each RFP, they collect a lot of data, data from all the stakeholders and they modify their RFP every time. And they're fine tuning their, their approach and their system in a way that's extremely efficient. And in the last three years, it's just unbelievable that uh, uh, they've done so much progress in just three or four years. So I think the, there is a lot to say, not only on the regulation, but also on the way you, uh, you approach it and you give a voice to all the stakeholders so that you can define the best system to be able to address the issue that you want to address. Great, thank you. Um, Kathleen mentioned um, um, opportunity for state and local to lead and many, many uh, municipalities are leading. Catherine, I'd like to see if you can pull that thread a little further and what are your thoughts on driving collaboration and uh, you know, working with the state and local entities? Yeah, I might um, unpack a little bit about what we're doing on environmental justice because I think it's a great example of, of you need, of course, support of policy to enable the clean energy transformation, but uh, the rules of the road, I like to say the paperwork is not the only the only thing that you need, you also need to actually cite and build these projects and their community support, community uh, engagement is absolutely essential. And of course, there's been an emerging conversation, an important and a right conversation that's been emerging, which is environmental justice. Um, it, uh, about a year ago, we shared that we had developed a set of environmental justice principles. Uh, we released them earlier this summer to the public, and we've been working over the past year to really um, figure out how do we operationalize them and make sure that our business has the right tools, the right screening, the right information to really ensure that as we're thinking about that next generation of clean energy build, that we're really understanding what are the environmental justice concerns that we may encounter in the communities where we operate. And so we've got some, we've pulled in some best in class screening that the EPA has. We've also been looking at how do we ensure that we're uh, flagging things for policymakers um, quickly when we, when we encounter um, any potential issue. And then we're also really leveraging the, the deep and the rich insights that our community relations and our district managers have. These are the folks that are out in the field with boots on the ground that really have the relationships um, with, with community members, with community leaders, so that we can flag anything that may not appear uh, in, a, in a screening tool or, or in, a, in a, um, a third party resource. And I would say that part of the reason things may not show up is because in some cases we're talking about history that may have been erased or have never made it into the record books. So I think you really do need to um, uh, ground truth the, the tools and the screening uh, information that is available with some of these uh, folks with, with access to folks with lived experience and or folks with lived experience. Um, but we're not really stopping there. I think one of the things that has also been really interesting is, as we've been leaning in as a company is also really looking at what are the community leaders 
think about the clean energy transition? What do they see as the opportunity and the challenge and the threat um, affiliated with that? And what we're hearing from community leaders when we sit down with them is that yes, um, they are really interested in environmental justice. This is a real issue for our country to wrestle with, but what they look at for the energy sector is a real opportunity um, to really understand how does the energy system work? And then more importantly and significantly, what are the opportunities for them, for their communities, for their families to participate in the clean energy transition? So what are the workforce opportunities and what are the economic development opportunities that we can be bringing to their communities as we, as we navigate the clean energy transition? So I, I can't underscore the importance of that community and that state support for the clean energy transition. It goes back to that earlier statement I made about the, the the pace of progress moves at the speed of trust. Um, and so really making sure that we're, we're being very intentional and purposeful, building this into our thinking and our planning. So I think it's a real time of empowerment. Well, uh, that, that, those are some great examples of kind of a uh, grassroots. Um, well, great, uh, let, let's turn the page to customers. And uh, as mentioned before, um, you know, I think a lot of the large corporates have caught up and even are leading. Um, and, you know, Guidehouse sees this with a lot of, the global and North American commercial industrial customers that we work on their sustainability strategy. And, you know, they're obviously not taking, taking a look, not only at their scope one, but also their scope two and three. And in many cases are driving significant changes across their supply chain. So I'd like to kind of get your thoughts on um, collaboration with customers, your customers, whether they're, you know, in the regulated sense or even the unregulated sense, and maybe some, how ex some examples of how your company is, is collaborating with these customers. So Kathleen, we'll start with you. Sure, and you know, in our case, of course, we're serving customers on a competitive basis. So we meet them where they are. Uh, and here I'm talking mostly about our larger CNI customers, uh, many of whom have climate goals, but, but the majority of whom don't. So we meet them where they are and we're trying to show them that they can move towards a more sustainable, at least on the electric side, but also on the gas side as well, a more sustainable um, energy supply chain. Uh, and we've seen that conversation evolve quite a bit. I mean, it used to be that we would have customers come to us just for a REC product, um, for example, renewable energy credit product, um, which of course is uh, a production of electricity from renewable generation somewhere at some point. Uh, but the conversation really is shifting more now towards meeting their demand on a 24 seven basis with carbon free energy and, and companies starting to set a goal of doing so within some number of years. And that's an important difference because if you're matching your demand with carbon-free energy every hour when you're consuming power, you really are decarbonizing your supply chain more than if you're just buying an annual uh, roster of RECs to meet you know, your annual consumption. Um, so we, as I say, you know, we, we are meeting customers where they are. Um, some of them are just starting this, this journey, but we're trying to give them transparency into uh, opportunities they may have to set goals and to meet them um, through the, the more evolved products that are now out there on the market. One of those products we call our Constellation Offsite Renewables uh, product or core E business. Um, and that's sort of a hybrid between the two things I just mentioned. It is uh, a product where a customer will sign up for a part of a new renewable project um, that we will match the customer to that developer with. We've done about 850 megawatts of new utility scale renewable projects since 2018 through this product. We expect this to exceed one gigawatt by the end of this year. And we have leading educational institutions like Johns Hopkins uh, and customer products like Pepsi and McCormick. Um, looking at these products and, and integrating them into their, um, into their supply of electricity to help make their goals a reality. We're also doing the same thing with, with governments. We have a, a core E deal with the um, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, uh, trying to get 50% of their annual consumption met by in-state solar. Uh, and we, we signed that deal earlier this year. And we have a number of other uh, projects in place, both on, with corporates governments, and then ho hopefully we'll see some of this type of procurement from the federal government as well. The Biden administration has started to talk about uh, how they're gonna go about procuring carbon-free energy on a 24 seven basis for uh, government consumption. That's a, a very important marker, I think, to set an example for the rest of industry uh, and to encourage uh, collaboration between suppliers and, and consumers of power. 
Great, great. Catherine, any examples uh, from Duke on, on customer collaboration? Yeah, I might just highlight some of the work we're doing on a resilient energy system um, because it's important as we seek to decarbonize uh, the energy system that we also ensure that we maintain reliability and affordability. We cannot lose sight of those really of those two really really important uh, components to the clean energy transition and the energy system today. And here, a lot of the work we're doing to make the the, the grid the energy system resilient is. Um, and resistance up you know, the standards, upgrading poles, upgrading wires, moving equipment so that it's out of flood zones. A lot of the kind of brass tacks that you would take to ensure the system is, is resilient. Uh, we're also making the grid smarter. And so, and now I'm gonna get well outside of my depth, but essentially a really smart grid that knows when there's a problem in one spot and can instantaneously um, move the power around so that we're up and running just, just as quickly as possible. We're also keeping an eye on keeping the grid and the energy system affordable through things like smart meters and innovative rate options. And at the same time, we know that sometimes some of our customers do run into unexpected life events that makes paying that utility bill particularly hard. And here, really leaning in with public, helping them um, reach public assistance funds, leveraging some of the funds that are available through the Duke Energy Foundation, and other means to make sure that we're really able to meet them in that time of crisis so that they're able to get on the other side uh, as quickly as possible. Great, great. Tristan, what about you? Examples uh, from an EDF uh, Renewables. Yeah, I think along the line of, uh, I mentioned earlier, the CNI large uh, VPPA contract that we're getting like like utilities on with, with a large CNI, commercial industrial customers. There is also the work that's being done on site. Interestingly, and just getting a little bit of history here, um, you know, we, we have power today, solar power that's going to be for the rest of humanity between, you know, 30, 35 bucks a megawatt hour because of all the R&D investment that's been done. And for that, I would like to give a plug to the Germans that started this, uh, this adventure in the early 2000s with uh, paying, you know, contract at, for 30 years at 350 euro a megawatt hour. They're still paying that today, but thanks for that. We have seen and then California stepping in 10 years later for 120 bucks a megawatt hour. And today we have a very inexpensive energy for the rest of humankind. And that's really fantastic. But as Catherine was saying, the issue that we have to solve is also the, that of resiliency of the grid. And smart grid is important and also producing where the power is needed is important. And that's why we have integrated our various um, on-site solutions for the customer rooftop solar, uh, EV charging, battery storage uh, to optimize the, uh, the, the site of the customer. And today it's amazing that you can provide a small microgrid for industrial sites or for an office facility and you can have a payback on seven to 10 years. So you green their, their, their generation on-site because you can produce on-site. And then by reducing that demand charging, you finance that, that investment, you provide very inexpensive uh, uh, electricity for their, for their employees to charge their EVs. And you do that and have a payback on seven to 10 years. So those, uh, the, 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 the technology progress that we have made over the last few years are also extraordinary, I think, to be able to make the energy transition affordable. We have still some challenges, but we're on the right path. Great. Well, well that, that's great insights. I um, want to pull one more thread. Uh, a couple of times uh, in some of the comments, uh, hydrogen has been brought up. So I wanted to um, spend a minute or two on that. And um, Kathleen, I know you, you've uh, you mentioned this before, but big plays in the energy transition, such as hydrogen, you know, naturally require um, um, a, you know, collaboration. So I want to get your thoughts, um, the best way to drive this collaboration. Yeah, thanks for returning to this in our last uh, few minutes. Such an important issue because uh, we really see hydrogen as, as quite the versatile clean energy carrier that can help us decarbonize, hard to decarbonize sectors. Um, I think we all know hydrogen's used now is really as a feedstock in the production of other products and it's almost always produced using fossil fuels. But Catherine mentioned the exciting project Duke has going at, at, down at Clemson, I think using green hydrogen, I think to run a, a cogen plant um, and that's because if you use electrolysis, you can, you can make hydrogen with zero carbon sources of production, uh, but we're just not doing that right now. Right now, less than 4% of current hydrogen production is coming from clean sources because it's not economic to do so. So no, that will change over time, but one way to, again, jumpstart that is for policymakers to provide an incentive for 
hydrogen to be created using clean sources and to be used in a, in a series of new use cases, which could include mobility, residential commercial buildings, synthetic fuels, and, it, and in Catherine's case, and power generation as well. Uh, we have gotten a DOE grant to build a, an electrolyzer at our Nine Mile Point nuclear plant in upstate New York. We're underway there and that project will com be completed next year, but it's really the funding opportunities in the BBB bill to create these hydrogen hubs that will get at the collaboration you're speaking of to get the OEMs, the EPC contractors, midstream, you know, production, transportation, storage, and supply of hydrogen all optimized in a way that can really set an example for the rest of the country. We're, we're very happy to see that in, that, in the, in the uh, infrastructure bill, um, one of those hubs uh, is, is uh, going to include nuclear and that's for a good reason. You can get an extremely high utilization rate to create hydrogen and an electrolyzer more than 90% um, if you use nuclear uh, relative to other sources of zero carbon energy. So you can not just make more hydrogen, but improve the economics as you spread the costs over more units of production. Um, and also, frankly, you know, create a dispatchable resource that can help uh, facilitate re uh, increased renewable penetration by pairing nuclear uh, with, a, with a, an electrolyzer. So we're participating with a number of consortiums and forums around this concept, bringing stakeholders together to, to help uh, demonstrate the, the potential for this market. And we look forward to seeing those hub projects submitted and, and the grants given by the DOE. Great, really great thoughts. I, this has been a very uh, fast paced conversation. Um, we've just touched the surface, but I just wanted to offer each of you any final closing thoughts before we wrap it up. We'll start with uh, you, Tristan. Yes, um, well, the, the closing thought is that uh, we, as COP26 uh, showed, we uh, every step of the way is really painful, but, uh, and there are many of us in front of us, but they're also very necessary and they're uh, productive for the next step. Recently, I was discussing with my 25 year old son about all the progress of the COP and you know carbon capture and, and hydrogen, et cetera. And I was telling him in a very structured way, how I think within the next 10, 20, 25 years, we can make enough progress so that we can inverse the trend and go back to, uh, you know, in another 25 years to go back to where we are today. And he turned to me and said, and I'm still have goosebumps, I'm sorry, but <laughs> he turned to me and said, dad, you're talking that my lifetime is gonna to take to go back to where we are today. And I had no, I was speechless. And that wow. makes me wake up every morning and go and want to do to carbon reduction, you know, every day, as much as I can, everywhere in any, any shape or form. We have, we're on the wrong trend. We need to inverse that trend so that we can go back to where we are. And it's gonna take a lifetime. And we owe that to our kids and grandkids. So sorry to be a bit emotional, but that's what drives me every morning. Yeah, it's quite impactful. Catherine, what about you? I'll be, I'll be brief. Um, one of the questions I got when I left Walmart was why are you leaving Fortune One to go to uh, a large utility, uh, but a large utility based in the Southeast of the United States? And I said, climate change is the issue that gets me out of bed in the morning. And this is the company and this is the sector that makes a difference. And if we're really, really, we roll up our sleeves and think meaningfully about how to do this in a way that addresses uh, climate resiliency, that addresses strong local economies and that is uh, keeps justice, equity and inclusion at the center of our work, we're gonna be heroes at the end. Um, and it's gonna take all of us working together, sharing knowledge, sharing insight, sharing challenges to get there, but I'm confident that we can. Great, and Kathleen, closing thoughts? I know we're over time, but we're, we're three very different companies here. And I think what you've heard is in a tremendous amount of enthusiasm for the work that we all need to do. Um, Tristan's 25 year old son, we'll leave it with him and, and the inspiration he should give to all of us to work harder than we are. Well, great. Well, I'd like to thank the, uh, the panelists. It's been a great conversation. We could have, we could have had a two hour session, but I think we, uh, we, we hit a lot of hot topics. So thanks to each of you for the time and uh, turn it back to you, Owen.